Welcome, my name is James Graves and this is another edition of Nigeria Rewind, the podcast. Coming up next week, next Thursday, the 25th, got another exciting group that's coming to the Peacock Lounge. Saxophonist, I met him at the John Coltrane tribute and uh, that whole John Coltrane was just brilliant. I love that whole thing. So anyway, he's gonna be performing, looking forward to it. I want everyone to meet him, see who he is, talk about his career, and uh, let's just get things hyped up. Jared Cruz, everybody. I'm doing real good. Yeah. Good, good. We got to go down memory lane. How did it start for you musically? Uh, I started in music in third grade. Well, first of all, I'm a saxophonist, so I started with the alto sax in the third grade. Um, and I started music because my mom um, she was a house cleaner at that time, and she had five kids, single mom, and she started she started work super early and got out super, super late. And so she told me she was like, "Hey, like your your school, your elementary school has a music program. Like either you're either gonna join the music program or you're gonna go into the YMCA with all the other kids." And my other my I have an older brother who also did music too. He didn't stay with he didn't stick with it, but he also was in that same program with me. And I ended up joining music instead of the YMCA and I just stuck with it. I, I stuck with saxophone. Middle school, I played also clarinet, flute, and then and then after that, high school too. And then I pursued music in college and I just stuck with it. What was it about the music? Well, let's, let's take it back. What was it about the saxophone that you just stuck with it? You know what? I, I think it was, my my brother and my and and well my siblings they're all they're all really into football uh, not not football they're all into <laughs> hockey and so so my brother used to my brother and I used to play the like like every time well I grew up in San Jose and they were fans of the the San Jose Sharks they're not doing well right now but <laughs> at the time at the time. Um, what we would do is we would mimic the horns. So every time the sharks like scored um, in the in the stadium itself, it would go like, mm -hmm. and I would I would be practicing, and then I would hear I'd hear them score, and then I would just blast as loud as I can. And it was, it was so much fun. I enjoyed it. My brother also would laugh every time I did it, and so it it just it just stuck. Yeah. You know you. Um... You play a genre of music, not just jazz. You know, you do R&B. You kind of really have the genre of uh, uh, creativity in a lot of different styles of music, which actually took you on the road playing with different groups. Uh, primarily, was it just trying to learn how to play the instrument? Was there a certain genre of music that you were really trying to adapt to at that time before you spread it out? Uh, I'd say I was, I just, at a young age, I really just enjoyed music. Um, I was a classical clarinet player, so I was I was doing wind band music and orchestra, um, also with flute. And then in middle school and high school, I was in my my high school jazz jazz ensemble. And with that, I felt like I was already really diverse. But then I got into college, and I was still doing classical clarinet. I was still doing saxophone, um, but I got really involved into like alternative rock, I got really involved with the R&B and soul, and all this other stuff. So I don't, I think I just really loved music at, mm -hmm. at, at a young age. And then even from that, like as, as a jazz saxophonist and especially a soul and pop artist too, um, I mean, growing up, like I, I love right now listening to like any R&B classic, you name it, I, I love it, you know? Um, but my mom wasn't the greatest, biggest fan of that. And so for the longest time, I wouldn't be playing any of that stuff. I would just be playing jazz standards and orchestra music. So, um, but like come to now, and even after college, like I see myself playing with a lot of pop ensembles, a lot of R&B soul ensembles, and also a lot of jazz ensembles. And I feel like that's how I got the biggest mix of my, of my music. That was what I was about to ask you, by you doing different genres of music, you really just broaden your spectrum of music, period. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. All genres of music was happening, because I've noticed that, you know, like you said, R&B, funk band, and 
he played with just different variety of musicians from some that were straight ahead to some that are a little bit more contemporary. Now, growing up playing this music, when did you really feel and say, you know what, I want to do this for a living? You know what, I, <laughs> I knew it really, really young. I really, really did. Like seventh grade, um, in seventh grade, I was in the, the, the high school honor band. So I was in the all northern, all state honor bands, you know, county honor band. I, I auditioned for everything. But it, I just didn't, I didn't wake up one morning though and was like, hey, like this is what I want to do. Like. I felt like I was discovered in the seventh grade with my high school, with my middle school band director. Actually, I came in, I came in super motivated, um, and at that time, like practicing was like effortless for me. Like I didn't have to like get reminded at all to practice or, or get told to practice my instrument. I just like came home and I was really excited to learn more about my instruments, whether that be clarinet or saxophone. And one day, uh, my my middle school teacher, my middle school band teacher, took me in the back room um, during one of the periods of our classes, and he told me, "Hey, like, you sound really good. Learn this music, and I'm gonna set this like I'm gonna set this recording like device for you. Like, learn it, play it, and then tell me when you're done. And then you can. You, that was I took two hours doing it, and I didn't know what it was for. I I just thought it was like like mm -hmm. I'm gonna learn a piece, you know, by myself." Mm -hmm. And he ended up taking that, um, taking that recording and submitting it for me, um, for the all state bands and all northern bands and like all these honor bands. And I got into all of them. And mm. from then, like, and the experiences I had with these honor bands, like, um, I, I'll always remember, like, like, you know, like hi high school and middle school band, like, the kids are that into the music, but like in the honor bands, like everybody takes it seriously everybody's i don't want to say well they really enjoy it nobody stuck up like that but like everybody was like everybody was very harmonious and serious about what they're doing with their instrument and so like that first time i played an honor band like and hearing a chord together hearing it in tune with everybody like i just knew like my my my, my, my hairs came <laughs> I got major chills mm -hmm. and i was like this is it like i want to be doing more things like this you know, and I, I'll never forget the feeling of my very first honor band experience. Um, it was in Stockton. Man. It was in Stockton. Mm. All, all, it was a junior all northern honor band. Um, uh, and I just remember sitting down and finding my chair. And it gave. I had my my chair placement, and and um, it had my name on it with what chair number I was and all that. And then I was sitting down, meeting the people, and then just hearing that first chord is just outstanding it was it was it was unreal it really was unreal one of the most best like best musical moments i've ever had in my life my name is james graves this is night journey rewind the podcast and we're visiting with oh we're busy with gerard crew and uh having a great conversation look you wound up playing like with ernie watts you wound up playing with a lot of different variety of musicians now as you were growing how did your introduction into some of the musicians that you want to play with, and then actually going on tour in Europe and the United States? Yeah, so um, like you said, Ernie Watts. Um, Ernie Watts came to my to, came to my college once, and um, at that time I went to San Diego State University. Uh, graduated in 2020, um, and the one of the last artists that came through was Ernie Watts, and. Um, he gave a master class once, and, and that that master class, he was asking everybody. He was like, "Hey, like, if, if you guys ever want uh, like a lesson from me, like, literally come up and ask me. Like, I'll I'll give it to you." And he was almost that straight up. And I saw him practicing right before uh, right before our show because I was in the jazz ensemble. We had a show together, and I came up to him and I was like, "Hey, like, were you really that serious about what you said?" And he's like, "You're the only student that came up to me about this. I was the first chair um, saxophonist at the university, like tenor sax." And I told him, "I'm like, hey, like, I really want to, I really want to do this." And he came by to another show in San Diego that same night after that concert. So I got to split the show with him after after that one show that we had together for the jazz ensemble. So. Um, Things like that um, was very spectacular, um, and through that university was was the European tour. I got to spend um, many weeks in uh, Montenegro, uh, which 
patriotism, which oh, is the wow. part of Latvia. And my my university was chosen to do this big um, this this big like represent the United States and this jazz conference thing. And we literally for for a couple weeks was like literally going to, like every city like a performance every day around the country. Right. And then we really got to explore that. We also got to, got we also got got to go and perform in Rome. several other places, but absolutely beautiful. We're, we're on the road for, for, for a minute. It was it was a really good time. And then the United States one just happened this past this past uh, this past year. I, I got a tour with the Dr. Gray uh, ensemble, uh, and I got to explore 16 different cities around the country. Did you say Dr. Dre ensemble? Yeah, Dr. Dre ensemble. Uh, it was it was uh, yeah it was it wasn't very really specific. Ensemble called, uh, it was, it was called, uh, the, the, oh my god, what is it, uh, what is it, 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 Quite the adventure. Like we got to play in really nice halls, a bunch of House of Blueses across the country. Um, absolutely insane, amazing. Now, did he put this together, or did whoever put this show together? They just wanted to use the music of Dr. Dre. Did he get their blessings to do it, or what? Yeah, they they, they did get their blessings to do it. Um, one of the biggest uh, things and help and support that we got was the artist uh, exhibit. Oh, okay, right. It's a big shout out, it helped us promote it like crazy. We really hope he's going to make it out to the show that ended up not coming out. But he knew about us, he was talking a lot about us, and that's how we got our show back. Wow, wow. So, in your young career so far, it seems like you've really kind of stepped out and been blessed to get in different genres of music going on tour. Exactly, yeah. Like the, the one in the United States was all hip hop. The one the one in Europe was straight ahead jazz, you know. It was it's just a wide variety of music. I have a couple of other artists. How did you hook up with Jeff Hamilton? Jeff Hamilton was another one that came through my university. Um, I actually got to meet him twice. Mm -hmm. um, the first time was through my university and we played a concert together in downtown San Diego. And then the second time was through um, the Disneyland um, All-American College Band. Uh, he came as a guest artist and played with us. And um, he had four different shows that, with us that, that weekend. And it was, it was absolutely incredible. Like his, his drumming is just absolutely sort of spectacular. <laughs> One last person, then we're going to move on. Chris Potter. Yeah, so I got to play with him in UCLA. Uh, <laughs> he, he did this really big master class over there and had a concert right after and um, invited a few students to play with him in that, that jazz concert series. So we all got to kick it and, and for like while after his master class and then we all got to play together. We, we ran through tunes, some tunes together and, and he like did all the arrangements on the spots and that man is absolutely insane. His like one of the most insane things about that musician was the fact that just how meticulous he is about his cadenzas, like saxophone cadenzas, and mm. how the theoretical like a theoretical approach that he had to to his saxophone cadenzas. Nobody was playing; it was just him. He would stay in time. He would play all the changes. Just absolutely spectacular. One of the most amazing musicians to watch. Now, I'm going to be unfair to you right now. <laughs> okay? Name some of, uh, they don't have to be, you know, saxophone players, but name some of your musicians that you felt really influenced you to this part right now of where you're at music. Where I'm at There's something about it sometimes that like whenever I'm like driving or, or like really like diving into like new R&B music because I have a I have a regular um, I have a
have a regular spot that I play in San Francisco called Lionfin. Um, that place is, is for my band, the 408 Collective. And with that band, we do we do all R and B, soul, pop, um, and it's it's like low key nightlife vibes. Mm -hmm. um, but the the very first set and a half, we we do all the instrumental in the first set. Um, and so usually what I do is I like to pick up a lot of like like pop, like soul covers from like from like R and B. Absolutely incredible artist. Um, I think Gerald Albright, honestly, is the one that I listen to the most right now. Since you play such a variety of music, which I think is always a plus in your playing, so let's say you're doing a, a straight ahead jazz set. Do a lot of the changes or a lot of some of the melodies that run through your mind that would be R&B, would you incorporate that into straight ahead set? Because a lot of it is based off the blues. Right, exactly, exactly. So a lot of it, I mean, of course I'll do, um, I like to, like, whenever I solo, I like to make sure that I know the changes first and get familiar with what I'm playing. Mm -hmm. And then slowly start adding all those, like, soulful, like, more, like, bluesy licks in there, you know? Just so I can, like, like, like feel it, you know? Like, get more in touch with what I'm playing. Well, you know, it's, yeah, that's one thing I'd love about this music. And I mean, all just, but especially with jazz, because these cats will be like, you know, jamming just straight ahead. Then all of a sudden, somebody might come in and say, da, 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 And then, quotes. boom, bust right back. Yeah, all the posts, and then come right back in and just like, <laughs> okay, I hear you, you know? So that's that's fantastic. Tell us, you know, you're going to be at the 25th, you're going to be at the Peacock Lounge. You're bringing in a quartet. Who's going to be there, and what do we expect from Mr. Cruz? So I got a fire ass lineup um i got bennett roth on the keys incredible jazz musician and soul artist um i got james wiley and i saw on your podcast that you had howard wiley before now get a load of james wiley the the brother the younger brother who plays bass um oh, okay and then i got um and then i got brandon walters on drums which is a really close friend of mine my age drummer um I think he's going up right now. He just got an award from San Jose Jazz very recently. Um, but all of those guys, like, we're, I feel like I feel very in touch with them because they have a very similar background that I do. Mm -hmm. We have that soul, R&B, uh, and very specialized in jazz, you know. I got, a, I got a degree in jazz, and I think everybody in my group got a degree in jazz. <laughs> so, so, like, and, and, when, and on the 25th, I'm super excited because we're going to be exploring that and the Peacock Lounge. We're gonna be exploring some jazz. We're gonna be exploring some traditional jazz with a soulful twist. I like doing that. I like I like having I like having and exploring newer newer musicians too. Um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be playing some Kamasi Washington. Um, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be playing some newer stuff and some old stuff, but with some twists. I'm also be gonna be premiering a new song. I haven't I haven't. Um, made a title for the song yet but that is something very excited i'm very excited to share um and with that i'm 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 so excited to be at the peacock lounge now do you do a lot of your own writing composings has that been a challenge for you or does it come pretty easy i'd say both and the reason why is because i can write easily for my bands and ensembles but it's harder to write for myself. Really? Yeah. And the reason why is because I'm a lot more pickier when it comes to my own, so my own self, my own style. I get something and I like something 
and then I just like immediately throw it away. Mm. Sometimes, or I don't throw it away, but I have it in the archives. And then maybe like a year or two down the road, I'll look through my archives and listen to things and see if I still relate with any of them. Or maybe I can develop an idea from that one. But for me, I, I see it as because I, I write and I arrange for a lot of different groups. Um, so that comes naturally to me. But making it for myself is always strange. I feel like it's like giving advice to somebody. You know, you mm. give so much advice to somebody because mm. you see it and all this stuff. But when it comes to yourself, you know, sometimes you, you know, you can't take, you know, you're, you're not the best advice for yourself. <laughs> right, yeah. right, right, right. Um, <laughs> I definitely know that one. I criticize my, on a lot of things, which is another subject. We won't get into that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Where do where do you see yourself? I know you see yourself musically, but where do you try to put yourself maybe 10 years down the line? You know what? I want to I want to be doing what I'm doing now, and that is playing with all of these amazing musicians, playing with a lot of different ensembles, touring, you know, recording. I want to do it still. I want to do that already. I'm already fully um, 100% full-time musician. Mm -hmm. So that's my job. I write, I produce, I play, I teach. Like, I have fully indulged myself already in music. In 10 years, I just want to be doing it all, but elevated. I want to do it better. I want to be where I am, but better, you know? I want okay. to be right. good music, better music. You know, I want right. to be writing for bigger ensembles, coming into bigger stages, and doing, doing as much as I can. Well, let me tell you, Mr. Cruz, Gerard Cruz, I'm really looking forward to you um, coming to the Peacock Lounge next week and bring your exciting quartet. Um, anything that you want to tell your audience to encourage them to come down to the show? I got a lot of new music. I got uh, an exciting ensemble. And you're just going to want to dance <laughs> and move and listen to us play the night away. Fantastic, man. Looking forward to you. Thank you so much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, he will be performing at the Peacock Lounge next Thursday. Night Journey Rewind, the podcast presents Gerard Cruz and his quartet. And looking really forward to it, bro. Looking forward to seeing you. <laughs> Sounds good, man. All right, man. Thank you so much.